Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. back of your mind, you just don't think it's, it's really going to happen. The COVID-related death of a just-elected congressman. What I find is that he has a genuine concern for people. Praise for Louisiana's new Chief Justice. To have this many bursts is kind of unusual and more than what we expected. New life begins nine months after a pandemic lockdown. Hi everyone, I'm Kara St. Cyr. And I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those top stories in a moment on this week's edition of SWI. But first, politicians from around the world are condemning the violence of Wednesday's assault on the nation's capital. They're urging respect for America's democratic processes. A total of five people, including a D.C. police officer, have now died as a result of the stunning attack by the pro-Trump mob. Senator Bill Cassidy came to LPV today. He recalled the events of Wednesday and what has unfolded since. Like most inside the Capitol, Cassidy was working, unaware of what was about to unfold. Uh, I was sitting at my desk and a, a fellow senator was giving a speech. I could see Mike Pence up on the dais and I like to take notes. And so I, I, I look, I look down to take notes and then Mitt Romney walks behind me real fast and he's clearly upset. And I look up and Mike Pence is gone. I mean, like he's gone, I'm like, I look down, I look up, he's gone, nowhere to be seen. And the speaker has stopped, and then someone says they've breached the Capitol. There's been a gunshot, and there's just kind of this rustle throughout the chamber. And people get up and start to leave, and the sergeant at arms gets on the dais where Pence had been and says, stop, don't leave. Uh, this is your place of safety. There's something happening, I'll give you more details. They took then members, you know, staffers who were in offices around the Senate chamber, and they began to bring them in. Clearly, we were the safe spot. They asked us to step away from the doors, which suggested to me that there was an active shooter, or at least the fear of it. But frankly, we didn't know what was going on. So at some point, I sit down, and my wife has texted me a picture. Ted Cruz is next to me. He's found something on the internet, and we're looking at each other's cameras to try and figure out what is happening. Then the sergeant at arms says, we have to evacuate. And it was orderly. We went down. And so we kind of all file out and there's a back way to go. But as we're going out, I can look down the hall and there's the rioters down the hallway with police between us. I don't think they saw us. Uh, we go down another level and police had moved a heavy piece of furniture in front of a glass door to barricade it. You felt like you were being assaulted. You felt like you were being assaulted, like our country was being assaulted, uh, like our democratic process was being assaulted. He returned home to Louisiana Thursday night to praise and criticism. Getting booed in the airport by people who were returning from the march in Washington, D.C., who felt like uh, the president's the most important thing, and I didn't stick up for the president. Uh, from people who said, wait a second, uh, you have to put country before party and before individuals, and thank you for doing so. And it's been all that. We all need in the nation to look at ourselves and see how our words reflect upon others. Is it bringing us together? Is it reminding us of the greatness of America, the freedoms that we have, but with these great freedoms comes great responsibility? That would be something that we should all reflect upon. Cassidy was the only one of six politicians that make up the state's GOP delegation who didn't vote to overturn the Electoral College vote. Now we'll look at other stories making headlines across the state. Louisiana is seeing the highest COVID numbers this week since the pandemic began. Governor John Bell Edwards says the positivity rate is about 18 percent in new tests. As the slow distribution of the coronavirus vaccine begins rolling out across the state, hospital leaders are warning about a bed shortage because of the influx of COVID patients. 
Lake Charles Mayor Nick Hunter has tested positive for the virus and is recovering at home. In a statement, Hunter says he's doing well and resting after a tough first few days. He says he's about a week into a 14-day quarantine. Those receiving SNAP assistance will see an increase in their benefits for the first six months of the new year, and more people in the state are now eligible. The additional benefits for January will be loaded onto current EBT cards today, January 8th. The money is part of the stimulus bill signed by President Trump before the end of the year. Tangipaho authorities this week arrested Meat City Councilman Emmanuel Zanders on eight counts of election fraud. Records show he was booked into Parish Prison and later released. In October, Tangipaho's Register of Voters raised concerns with the Secretary of State's office. Zanders is accused of illegally registering voters at addresses in his council district where they didn't live. The state will increase mail-in balloting options for spring municipal elections and two special elections for the U.S. House. Election officials say they will also use the same absentee-by-mail voting that was in place for the summer and fall elections. This week, more than 100 pharmacies across the state began getting the vaccine for people 70 and older. Many health care workers have already been vaccinated. We talked with a nurse from Oxner Medical Center in New Orleans about it. Brad Harrison has completed the two-shot process. I talked to a couple of my uh, co-workers. Uh, one of them said she was real tired. Uh, for for the day after i know last night I, it was a it was a particularly stressful night but i had had the vaccine before and i thought all right well does my stomach hurt because it's a hard night at work or does my stomach hurt because the vaccine but i mean it didn't really hurt like i'm i'm back home now and i'm fine but you know when you hear all that stuff it it's impossible for some of it to not get in your head even if it doesn't deserve to be there but yeah, I mean, for me personally, I haven't noticed really any adverse reactions or side effects. It, it was kind of cool uh, in, in a way to know, you know, that like being on the front line that we were one of the, that I was going to be one of the first people to get it. That was, that was kind of neat uh, in a way because, you know, you just, you worry, I'm, obviously you're, I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to wearing the mask out in public and all that stuff, but you just, you worry, what if I accidentally slip up? It feels a little bit you know, better. Like, I feel like, okay, well, maybe if I make a mistake or an accident, I, I've got like a little more coverage. I, I work uh, as a dialysis nurse uh, for Oshner's main campus uh, in New Orleans, uh, the, the main one on Jefferson Highway. And the, the type of dialysis that I do is for the inpatients uh, in the ICU that are, uh, instead of being on like a regular uh, type of dialysis treatment where you would go like on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. These are the ones that are on like a continuous dialysis while oh. they're in the ICU. COVID uh, made uh, the dialysis unit much busier because one of the things that the virus hit was the kidneys on a lot of people and they would have uh, acute kidney injuries uh, is the, the, the word for it. And uh, some of them, it, it would knock it out and they would never recover from it. Others, you know, would be able to recover from it. But yeah, we were running dialysis on lots and lots of people uh, back in, in March and April when it was the worst that it was. And we want to hear your thoughts about the vaccination. We are launching a new interactive survey feature on our broadcast. Just go to lpb.org slash SWI survey to give your thoughts and see what others think. I, John L. Weimer, do solemnly swear that I will support that I solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution and the laws of the United States. The Constitution and laws of the United States. That's a look at the swearing in ceremonies Thursday at the State Supreme Court building in New Orleans. John Weimer was born and raised in Thibodeau, went to Nichols State and then LSU Law School, and was sworn in as Louisiana's new Chief Justice. He's one of only 12 justices named in the last 100 years. Two people who know him well are praising him. I talked with Thibodeau attorney Harold Block and former judge and CASA director Kathleen Ritchie. I met John um, in the mid 70s when he was the student government president at Nichols University and I was the student government president at Louisiana Tech. And in those days, the student government presidents met regularly to address challenges that all of the campuses shared. 
And so I was in a work situation with him, but you know, we were college kids and we spent a lot of time um, just having fun. And my recollection is John Weimer was a pretty good pool player. We spent a lot of time doing just fun stuff and, and developed a friendship. There were about five of us that, that really stayed connected. Our law careers have sort of coincided when he was on the trial court bench in the 7th Judicial District. I was on the juvenile court bench here in Baton Rouge, and occasionally we would talk about particularly challenging cases. And I really reconnected with Justice Weimer when I took this position with uh, Louisiana CASA because I work with the court um, to promote the programs. And CASA, as you know, is court-appointed special advocates for children. There's 17 programs in the state um, that serve uh, all but one judicial district. So each of the courts has access to CASA volunteers and we coordinate through the Supreme Court. Um, I've, I have found him to be a, a real champion for children. And what I find is that he has a genuine concern for people. I think Justice Weimer and really the whole court want to, want to ensure that the people of Louisiana have have their situations bettered. And this is particularly important for children. How would you say that he may approach this position in a different way because of who he is than some other might have. Well, John has a, a really wonderful sense of humor. Um, so I think it's, he, they're gonna have a lot of fun. Um, okay. I also think that Justice Weimer has a certain um, humility and, and an innate ability to relate to people of all walks of life. So I think that the citizens of this state are gonna have the leadership of the court um, really be sensitive to their needs and understand and in, intend to have the law work on behalf of people. John Weimer has been a friend of mine for a very long time. And I, I think I am extraordinarily pleased and proud of the fact that he is becoming the Chief Justice of the Louisiana Supreme Court. As you may or may not know, there have been very few Chief Justices from our area. Uh, Justice LeBlanc was the Chief Justice many, many years ago, I believe. He was from Napoleonville. And of course, Edward Douglas White from Thibodeau was United States Supreme Court Justice. But this is a Justice rare honor Scott for someone Brinkin, from Wilson out here Parish, in the country, as we like to say. He went from being a professor at Nichols State University to being on the Louisiana Supreme Court in a short, in the short period of six years, which is really unheard of. But it's just a sign of his affability and the, he has a way of making friends. It's just extraordinary. Stunned mourners pay tribute in Monroe Saturday for Luke Letlow. He was just elected as the state's newest congressman. He died December 29th after contracting the COVID virus. He was only 41. A best friend said of him, he made people feel they were the most special in the world. USA Today political reporter Greg Hilburn knew him well and talked about the loss. I was stunned even though I had been following his illness and his hospitalization and I knew it was very serious and I even talked to him just two or three days before while he was in ICU. And so I knew this was a possible outcome, but of course, in the back of your mind, you just don't think it's, it's really going to happen. I mean, he's 41 years old, he's in good health. It's, it was, it was, it's a terrible tragedy of, you know, a, a promising career cut short it's, and life cut short. It's terrible. This is a young man, his mom and dad, you know, his folks, his wife, his two little children who won't, you know, won't remember the funeral, a little girl, one year old, a little boy, three. And um, it, it was a somber event. I, I went early and then I left and covered it from the live stream because I, it was going to be a deadline situation and it was going to go past. But it was a it was a somber it was a somber moment, just people in shock too still. There's been a lot of social media about that, that he was some kind of an anti-virus, anti-masker Republican. Uh, he was not, he was, there are photos of him without mask where he was obviously careless, but I've seen him many cases wearing a mask. My last interview at his house, as I walked up, he put on a mask before I came in. So yes, there were times when he was careless, like, uh, but he was certainly not, an anti-masker or, or a COVID denier, uh, not, a, not in any sense of the word. This is somebody who's been preparing for this stage his entire life. As you know, he started while he was at Louisiana Tech. He was a driver for former Congressman John Cooksey 
and when he was 20 years old, he went to work for, you know, a, a political wonderkin and young Bobby Jindal, who was young and energetic and charismatic. And he went on to work for the governor, Jindal, both when Jindal was a congressman and then later when he became governor. He left politics and left the state just briefly before Congressman Abraham asked him to come back and run his first campaign. And then, of course, as you know, he was Congressman Abraham's chief of staff for all three terms. So you can see that he, in an interview, he told me, he said, I was taking the best of all of these people, which were extraordinary talents. I was taking all of the best of them with me to Washington and use that experience and that guidance. And that was much of what he, he ran on, was that he may have not been uh, in a political office, but he's been around it his entire life and, and been involved with the process. His passion was for Louisiana. I've known him personally since he was young, since he was 20, driving Congressman Cooksey around in that, in that vehicle. So he loved Louisiana history. He'd go to, he's always, he used to send me books or old photos or from graveyards or in church graveyards around Louisiana. He just had a passion for, for Louisiana, especially rural Louisiana. I covered him, uh, but we absolutely, I'd known him since he was 20 years old and I knew it and know his brother. And then I got to really know Luke when he was entering the political arena. And I really got to know him a lot better when he was working for then Congressman Jindal. People who lose someone suddenly will tell you that shock is your best friend for that time period until you can begin to believe that this has happened. I think that's going to be the impact on, on his family, his friends, but you know, life, you know, life continues for that young family. And now his wife, Julia, very accomplished in her own right, is considering running for that seat to fill that vacancy. My understanding is that they'll make that final decision and announcement next week. Greg, thanks so much for that. We have learned this week that Alexandria businesswoman Candy Kristoff, a Democrat, will run in the special election for this 5th district. She narrowly missed making the December 5th runoff. Nearly nine months after the stay-at-home order began, some Louisiana hospitals are starting to see an unusual uptick in babies born this year. I spoke with the chief nursing officer at Women's Hospital in Baton Rouge, and she says the jump in births is just getting started. After three years of trying, the Frittles still weren't able to grow their family. The situation felt hopeless, but Kirsten Frittle knew she had to try. We had to see fertility doctors. We had fertility tests done. It finally seemed like everything was going in the right direction for Frittle and her husband, Justin. They were signed up for in vitro fertilization until the pandemic hit. In vitro appointments were canceled for about a month. And then a miracle happened. Frittle gave birth to a healthy baby boy on January 1st. He was the first baby born in the new year. His name is Jax Frittle, and to his parents and the staff at Women's Hospital, he's perfect. But he's also part of a bigger picture. Baby Jax is part of the baby boom happening in Louisiana right now. More babies are projected to be born this year than previously thought. I had an appointment like two weeks prior, like December. It was like a week before Christmas. And my doctor was asking me what my plan was because the induction schedule was so full. At Woman's Hospital in Baton Rouge, the staff are preparing for a jump in births toward the spring. Cherie Johnson, the chief of nursing at Woman's Hospital, says they were expecting only about 8,000 babies for 2021. But following the lockdown and the different phases, she says they've estimated about 200 more babies than expected, with the most popular month being in March. So we really thought that we might see a continued decline in birth rates. We kind of have to go with what we're seeing nationally. And nationally, the birth rate had been dropping consistently since 2014. From January to September, the Louisiana Department of Health tracked more than 43,000 births in 2019. In 2020, during that same time span, there were only about 42,000 births. Even five years ago, people were having a baby, you know, 24 to 26 years of age, and now we see it 27 to 28 years of age. Johnson credits the uptick to about three things. 
severe weather events, celebratory events, and of course, anything else where people are forced to be around each other for long periods of time. And in 2020, there was no shortage of either. Louisiana suffered through several hurricanes, many of them devastating. There was also COVID-19 keeping everyone indoors. Things like that, there's going to be a slight uptick in bursts, just things that kind of bring people a little bit closer together. Um, we, we do see a little uptick. Although uh, this long of a, a stretch within a quarter to have this many bursts is kind of unusual and more than what we expected. But there is some anxiety that comes with being pregnant during difficult times like these. Ashley Bass is set to give birth this March, and she's worried about what obstacles she might run into with the pandemic still going strong. You have all these things that go through your mind, so you're already stress or your anxiety is kind of high because of the pandemic, but now you have that added pressure on top of it. Um, just making sure that you plan and have the proper preparation before she gets here. One of the things Base is worried about is childcare after her baby girl is born. Base will still have to work and her daughter will need to be somewhere safe. Her only hope is that things turn around in 2021. But hopefully 2021 is has a better um, outlook and everybody can just slowly start to get back to normal. Baton Rouge General Hospital is also seeing that jump in pregnant women. A spokesperson told me prenatal visits in 2020 were up by 20%. How will college campuses look when school opens for the spring semester? I talked with LSU System President Tom Galligan and UL System President Jim Henderson. We're looking back at how fall uh, worked and there were a lot of great lessons learned from fall. A lot of the things that we, we put into place worked uh, exceptionally well. Uh, and then we're incorporating the things that we've learned about the virus since then, how it's transmitted, how we can uh, uh, prevent transmission or mitigate uh, transmission. And so we're incorporating uh, some expanded testing and uh, we're utilizing some new types of testing that will uh, make testing more available, more quickly understood and, and results more quickly uh, known. Uh, and we think that's gonna enhance this and make, make the spring similarly successful. We are eliminating the block one week spring break and we are distributing the days that students would have had off throughout the semester. So instead of having a whole week off for spring break, uh, students will have a day here, a day there. Uh, that was at their request. We thought it was a very reasonable request. Um, they need breaks. Uh, what we want to discourage is we want to discourage them going away en masse uh, to some beach somewhere and then coming back. If a student is not comfortable being on campus, they can even begin the semester with online learning and remain online throughout the semester? Correct. We're still going to be wearing our masks. We're still going to be washing our hands. We're still going to be physically distant and we're going to have a whole lot of testing. The best way we can combat this virus is changing human behavior, right? Or adapting, even if it's just for a short time, human behavior. We know that, that wearing masks and keeping physical distance prevents or at least strongly mitigates the spread of this disease. And we saw that because we've been unable to find a single case of in-classroom transmission. There was one study that came out that if everyone followed mask protocols or 70% of people followed mask protocols to the letter, we could basically eradicate the virus over the course of three to four weeks. That's powerful. You, you've heard a lot about wastewater testing uh, mm -hmm. that there was uh, an approach that was pioneered at LSU. We've got an approach that was pioneered at UL Lafayette uh, that we are using to identify uh, uh, levels of the virus in, in collective communities, in dorm rooms, if you will, or, or dorm spaces. Wastewater has been a godsend. Um, we've tested every week. We will continue to test. Uh, uh, John Pardue, Gus Kasoulis, and their team will test uh, next week, first day of classes, Monday and Tuesday. We'll get test results. Um, we'll act accordingly. Uh, so it's, it, enables, it enables us to target a particular residence hall or area on campus 
where there, there's virus and to go in and to say the people who live in this area, um, you got to get tested. I'm not sure we're in, in the gun lap uh, of, of this. I know you're a former track athlete, so you know the gun lap. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure we're in the last lap, but, but we can see the light at the end of the tunnel with the vaccines. We're social animals. People want to be social. And so it's, it's I, I, I don't make light of it. It's difficult to stay apart, but it's absolutely important that we do that now so that going forward, we can, we can enjoy all of those liberties, all those pieces of that joie de vivre, if you will, that make us who we are. And classes begin next week. Well, everyone, that's our show for this week. Remember, you can watch anything LPB anytime, wherever you are, with our LPB app. You can watch LPB news and public affairs shows, as well as other Louisiana programs you've come to enjoy over the years. And please, like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone here at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. And I'm Kara St. Cyr. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.